lovely to see so many people here this afternoon. I think that our guest this afternoon doesn't really require much of an introduction. His, um, his reputation precedes him. Uh, he is the GM extraordinaire, the adventurer extraordinaire, and the entrepreneur extraordinaire, uh, based here in Dubai. Currently GM, uh, Gen managing director, isn't it? Yeah, seven tides. Of seven tides hospitality, with an extensive background in uh, management of hotels. So please give Mike Scully a very warm welcome. To Okay, th thanks very much. Um, I think just to try and just give you a bit of uh, background, just a little bit what I've done in the past, how I've liked to operate, how I see the hotel industry going, um, how I see it possibly going for you guys, where you want to go. If I was in your position, what I would be doing now to try and get to where hopefully you're going to get to one day. Um, what will be quite interesting, you know, I was sitting in the same seat as you guys about 25, 30 years ago. And if I look back at the guys that were in, in my year um, at hotel school in South Africa, where I started in, in Johannesburg, um, I think I'm probably about the only guy left in the industry. And certainly from a hospitality and hotel side, I'm about the only one left. A couple of the guys have gone into catering. Some of them have gone and opened their own restaurants, have, have developed into um, entrepreneurs on their own, own their own businesses. But almost, I'm about the only one who's actually stayed in the industry itself. And I think from your point of view, it's going to be interesting to see how you guys develop yourselves and how you like the industry, how you like the hours, how you like the, the whatever you're going to actually do in the industry, whether you've got a real entrepreneurial background and spirit, whether you actually want to do your own business, whether you have family who have got businesses that you're going to go into. Um, you know, there's going to change. But one thing is for sure that whatever you do from here, it really does set you up well for where you're going to go. And I think something that I, I certainly remember from um, my hotel school days is that you, uh, you actually learn very little while you're here. You know, it's one of these things that what you learn here is how to do things. What you learn in the industry is who you are and how you are and what you can actually do to develop it. So whatever you learn, this is just a very small first step in where, where you're going. And what you're going to do is you're going to get an idea from here as to what you like in the industry, what sectors of the industry you want to go into, where you see yourself going. And you'll start formulating, without even realizing it, I'm sure you'll start formulating already ideas as to what you really like, what, what, what makes you spark. You know? And I'm sure that some of you will stay in the hospitality industry, in the hotel industry. Some of you will go off and do your own, your own thing. Some of you will find inspiration through what you're doing here to go into it. And remember that the tourism industry is huge. And um, just here in Dubai, Sheikh Ahmed the, the other day was, I was speaking, and he said that they worked out that in Dubai, 60% of the GDP is in the travel and tourism industry. Now, that's huge. Huh? For a, if you take a city like, like Dubai, um, I think it was Dubai or the UAE, but it's certainly Dubai. I mean, obviously, with Abu Dhabi having oil, so it was probably a bit, it's probably more Dubai-based. But 60% of everything in Dubai is tourism orientated. So whether you actually end up managing hotels or whether you do something in the travel industry, the, the travel trade, um, in, in, in travel agencies, uh, supply of travel goods, and uh, supply of hotel goods, um, marketing, marketing into the hospitality, the travel industry. There's a huge, huge sector, an industrial sector around it. But what I wanted to just say is, is that, you know, as I've gone through life, obviously from hotel school, before I was in hotel school, I was, I was in the army. In South Africa, we had to all go to the army. And I was very, very fortunate in that I was put into a a group into a, into, a, into a training division where I trained Bushmen. Now, I don't know if any of you ever come across Bushmen. And the Bushmen are a little bit about like the, the original Aborigines or the original Eskimos. And there are only very few groups uh, of these people left around the world. If you go to the Amazon jungle, you can find a group of, of, of Amazonia, Amazonian tribesmen who have never seen civilization. 
They've never worked with anyone in their lives. They've never seen white men, for example. And you know, so you've got, you've got groups there. You've got, you've got people in, say, the Eskimos until quite a long time ago. Um, you had the Aborigines, again, who were literally Stone Age. And then I was put into this battalion to go and integrate and look after these Bushmen. And they were the most incredible um, uh, characters. And, and they literally didn't know anything. And you know, one day I was standing there, and I was giving them general knowledge. And I had a blackboard like this. You know, and I was standing there, and I, and I started drawing. And I, I said to them in, in general knowledge, I said, you know, a man like you and I has been to the moon. And you know, they'd seen planes flying over and that type of thing. And you know, I said, and I said and everything was done through a translator. You know, so there's little guys, and they, they speak with clicks. And they're all sitting there. You know. And so I said to them, you know, the man's been to the moon. And they were like that, and all smiled. And then I drew a picture of the rocket. You know, I drew this rocket, and I did all the flames and made it look really good. And I said, three men went on a rocket like that to the moon. Anyway, went to the guys, and they all started shaking their heads. You know, I can't, there's no way. You know? So I said to the translator, I said, why is it that man, they believe that man's gone to the moon? You know, they, they worship the moon, and they've seen the moon. And why don't they believe it when I show them a picture of the rocket? Anyway, he came back and he said, they don't believe that three men could fit in a rocket that size. <laughs> and that just showed you, and it just showed you, just gave you an idea. I had no idea the comprehension that I was going to have with these guys. No idea. And you're going to find this all along. As you start getting into, into depending where you go in the world, and you could go into Africa, into the middle of somewhere, and, and, and get new staff. You couldn't go into areas where they don't know hospitality, they don't understand hospitality, they don't like hospitality, yeah? from, from a point of view, or it may have a stigma to it. Or, and you're going to probably get into situations where you are going to be speaking or training and working with people who have not got an idea. And not that they haven't got an idea, they don't comprehend. They don't understand what service is. Maybe they like to be served. You know, how many people actually like to serve? Does anyone here like to serve? You do, about five of you. <laughs> but you see, I mean, how many, but, but who likes to be served? Yeah, everyone, yeah, we, all like, we all like to be served, don't we? How many people actually like to be served? How many people really understand service? You know, you're gonna find this, this is gonna be your biggest problem. When you go out into the industry, you're gonna understand service because you've been taught. That's something which you have been taught really well here. You'll have been taught how to serve. And you'll be taught, the, the principles of marketing, and you'll be taught the principles of everything. But once you actually get into the industry, the reality is going to get home. And you're going to sit there, and you're going to sit with your whoever it is, and you're going to start talking about how you want to do a PR campaign, and you want to do a marketing campaign, and you want to go and you, know, you want to fill hotels, and you've heard that this type of restaurant is going to work, and this is how we're going to do it. But the majority of people that you're going to be dealing with aren't going to have a clue. You've got to understand that you're going to have to teach these guys and you're going to have to lead them right the way through. And what you've got is, is you, really, you're working in an industry of people who, of, of, of a labor force who need to be led the whole way. You're going to find that as you go through, if you don't lead that labor force, you actually won't achieve everything you want to achieve. And you won't get the productivity. And I think one of the, the successes that I've had, certainly in this region, and I've opened, I've opened six hotels here. I will have opened six hotels now. I've opened the Crown Plaza, um, Minas Hiaki, you know, uh, the Western Minas Hiaki, Meridian Minas Hiaki. I've built the Barasti Bar. Um, we're about to open the one that you just see now. We should open that by the end of this year. We just opened the Ibn Battuta Gate. And one thing I can tell you that if you want to succeed, You've got to be there on the ground. You've got to be working with the guys. You actually have to take people through every sector of what you want to do to make it successful. What you will find is that as you develop and as you work with the same people, and if you can retain staff, if you do, when you get into the industry, if you can retain people, okay, you are going to be a million miles ahead of any of your opposition. If you just Whatever you do is look after the people. Look after the staff with you. Look after your management. Look after your, your team. Look after the people who do well. If people don't do well, you obviously always try and turn them. And if you can't turn them, well, then let them go. You know, they obviously aren't in the right industry. 
They obviously don't understand what you're trying to get at, and you're going to have to move on. Because, I mean, business is business. Eh? Just remember one thing, that we're here for one reason only, and that is to make money for the owners that we work for. Now, if you're one day an owner, whether it's your own restaurant or your own hotel or it's a family business, you'll understand that you're there for one only reason only. But you have to get ahead of the game. And if you want to beat the opposition, you want to beat the hotel next door to you, you're going to have to understand the business of it, and your staff are going to have to understand the business of it. I mean, if you take Barusti Bar, who hasn't been to Barusti Bar? One, two, three. Okay. Why have all of you been to Barusti Bar? Okay. You obviously went for a meal. And, um, <laughs> but I mean, Barusti Bar is, was the busiest bar in the world. I mean, Heineken, Foster's, and Amstelite couldn't find a bar busier than that. And I mean, my, my last year at Minasiaki, we took 85 million. We took 85 million from Barasti, and the hotel took 77 million. So that just gives you, gives you a bit of an idea. But let me tell you, the only way Barasti worked was because we pumped it, and we pumped it, and we pumped it. I used to come back from, from leave, and I knew that the, the dynamics of the bar had changed. I knew it. I could just see that the clientele had come in. Some manager had made a decision to close at this hour or open at this hour or done something, sometimes thinking it was good, and sometimes it was good, but sometimes it wasn't good. And sometimes people did things without understanding the chemistry of what we were trying to achieve there. And the chemistry of the Barastium, we all know, it's relaxed, it's easygoing, it's fun, you know, the right clientele, none of the bad clientele, you know. And what that does is it attracts it. The music was good, it was fun. When the music got stale, we opened somewhere downstairs to try and get a slightly more modern feel to it. And what we always try to do was try and keep the dynamics right for, for, for what we wanted. And we just kept on, and it kept on working. We made more money and more money and more money. And we made bigger and bigger. And that's a success story, you know? And that's, that's what it's about to, to understand the dynamics, to have the staff who, who know it. I mean, I now go, if I go to Nassimi, one of my managers running that. If I go to, um, what's that Irish bar in, in JLT? Oh, yeah, you see. There we go. That's one of my guys is running that. Um, all the top places, most of them in town now, are being run by ex-Barusti Barusti guys. And you know, these are people that came through, they learned it, they understood the dynamics, and what happens? They get stolen. And that's your next objective. Your next objective is going to be to get stolen. You want to get stolen. You want to do the stealing so that everyone who, who, who's good in town wants to work with you, and you want to get stolen. You want some phone call at some stage from an opposition group saying, listen here, yeah, can we meet for a coffee somewhere? Who watches Mad Men? You like Mad Men, huh? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Mad Men, what's Mad Men? Mad Men is, uh, no, no one knows Mad Men. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a chance, uh, watch it if you, if you haven't watched it. It's so good, and it's about the advertising industry in the 60s. And through, within Mad Men, okay, they have all the complexities okay, of, of, of the characters, obviously, like any soap opera. But what they do have, which is really good, is they, is they have all these business scenarios in the marketing world. And you can learn so much about the business of the scenarios. But you can see there, you know, the good guys are wanting to be stolen by the, by the competitor agencies all the time. And this is they're busy watching out to see who are the good guys. And remember, the, the, the marketing world is, is dynamics. Eh? It's all about dynamics. So the, the most creative guy at the time is a guy who wins a contract. You know? And if you're really good and you're really creative, you can go and get taken by, you can take your clients with you as well. And that's your next objective. So you want to get someone who, who knows the business, who's going to bring clients with you, and is ahead of the game. And that is your objective. That's going to be your objective when you, when you get in there. And there's only one way you're going to do that, is by knowing the business, being effective, and, and, and creating. You know? So that's just a, you know, a little bit of background. You know, I, I've obviously, as I say, we've opened, opened those hotels, had various experiences in, in over time, which I've learned from. And one of those I'll, I'll give you was when I was, um, I was working in London when, when they had the Lockerbie. Do you remember Lockerbie? Everyone remembers Lockerbie? Yeah. Probably some of you don't. But it's uh, only because you're too young. But uh, Lockerbie was when they, they had the, the Pan Am flight going over Scotland and um, blew up. And recently, obviously, because of everything that's been happening in Libya, it's been, they've been talking about it again. But I was running this, I wasn't running it, I was, I was operations manager of a, of a 600 room hotel in London. 
the Nova Cell in, in Hammersmith. It's a huge one. It used to be the Cunard Hotel. Right on that. If you're leaving London, it's a huge one, just on that uh, fly of it. And um, the day as Lockerbie happened, the next morning, every single room coming into the hotel cancelled. And the reason that almost every room cancelled was at that time, we were very big with the American market. And the American markets literally, I mean, if something happens in, in, in world travel, just remember one thing, the Americans don't travel, okay? The British, funny enough, and the Europeans aren't quite, the British carry on, and I think that probably stems from all the Northern Ireland days and whatever else that they had. You know, they became shell-shocked almost into not being too worried about travel if something happened. The American market cuts, okay? So if something happens, goes down, 9-11, American market cut, you know? And because I was in London and, and, and I'd gone through that, I knew you know, I, I'd had an experience. And literally, I say, we went dead for, for weeks and weeks and weeks afterwards. Anyway, I was working, I was, I was running Minas Yaki here um, when 9-11 when, um, happened, okay? And literally, as 9-11 happened, I got hold of our, our marketing agency and I said to the guys, put a, put a double-page advert in the Gulf News tomorrow morning Rooms, I think it was 150 dirhams or whatever it is. And so the next morning, we had rooms, 150 dirhams. Everyone else in, in, in Dubai was empty, and we, and we packed out. And in the first, the first management meeting we had, we sat down and I said to the guys, what can we do for the people in Dubai? What's going to happen is you know no one's going to travel in, so no one's going to have any work to do. We were full, but no one else was as far as, as, as Dubai was concerned. And we came up with the idea of starting the beach parties. I don't know if any of you remember the beach parties we used to run at Minas Yaki. It was actually the precursor to Brusty exploding. And it was because of those beach parties that we did. And within two weeks, we had 4,000 people coming to our beach parties. I mean, they were mini Nassimis or whatever else you've got now, uh, sand dancers. I mean, they literally just took off. And it was, again, it was done because of an experience knowing what had happened and, and reacting. And it's all about reacting, so understanding. And as you get more and more experience, you'll, you'll, you'll learn to react that much quicker, that much faster. You'll, you'll, you'll see the signs. You'll know the warning signs. You'll understand rates are starting to dip. Why is that happening? What's happening? Who's scared of what? Is there another Arab Spring people are worried about? Is it Iran that people are worried about? Is it Afghanistan? You know, is India and Pakistan, are they starting to, to save a rattle? And, and these are all signs that you learn to pick up as you start doing business and identify. Now, obviously, the, the most obvious ones are things like 9-11. I mean, and I was the only guy in Dubai who reacted to it. And if I hadn't been in London during Lockerbie, I wouldn't have reacted either only because I wouldn't have understood the warning signs and I wouldn't have had experience in it. So experience counts a huge amount, but what I'm really saying to you is that take note of everything, because somewhere you're gonna to need to use that to have a reaction to something. So yeah, so they, they did that and then um, I say uh, opened uh, the Western Hotel, left that to start my own business. And as I started, I started my own business. And before I left Minas Yaki, and I told them before, I gave them six months notice so they could find someone. But I said, while I'm doing in that six months, do you mind if I get my own business going? And while I was getting my own business going in those six months, I picked up four hotel management contracts. And the, the hotel the group was called First and Foremost. And I, and I had, I say, four, four management contracts. And within those six months, the crash came. And all four hotels that, I was, that were being built for first and foremost, all stopped being built. Okay. So I eventually, so I changed and I went into management consulting and joined Seven Tides to, to take them and actually work for them now. But to take them forward and, and do it. So hopefully I don't have to learn from the crash again. Maybe that's my last crash. We hope it's the last crash. But you never know. I'm sure it will happen again. I'm sure somewhere I would have learned from that, you know, before, if you're going to go into your own business, don't go when there's about to have a crash. Now, someone else would have recognized that there was a crash, and I didn't. You know, so someone else would have been clever, and I, and I wasn't. So, you know, you live and learn. And this is what experience, experience does, and experience takes you. So that's really, you know, what, I, what, that's great. That's what, great. I, what I've got. And then, I don't know how many of you have read my articles. Did anyone? Yeah. Did you? 
Oh, good. Okay. And um, to be honest, these articles, I started writing them about a, a year ago or whatever. And I had so many general managers of hotels coming up and saying, yes, when I stopped them, why have you stopped them? Because we really liked having them. And the reason they liked them was I took a bit of an alternative view. And you'll find that as you work going to the corporate world and that, the corporate world is a very protective world. Huh? They're extremely protective about their product, their brands, who they are, and how they are. And that's very good. And they do a fantastic job. I mean, the corporate world is the world you want to get into. And I'm talking about the, the big corporate branded world, you know, the Hiltons of the world, the Kempinski's of the world, the Hyatt's, the Starwood hotels. I mean, if you want to go and get a, get a, a career and go up in, in life, before, don't really go and start in boutique hotels. Get stuck into the big ones. I mean, my first hotel that I actually worked in was Sun City in South Africa. I don't know if anyone knows Sun City. And Sun City gave me an insight into the hotel industry second to none. I mean, we at the time, we were like the Las Vegas of Africa. We had all the big stars coming in. It was razzmatazz. We had casinos. We had dancing girls. We had a whole lot. I mean, this was fun. Huh? I mean, it was just the best place. And I'd just come out of the army, and I'd just come out of hotel school, and it was just the place for me. You know, it's the type of place I needed to be because, you know, I enjoyed a bit of life, and I enjoyed Sun City. I learned more Sun City with Sol Kersner than I probably learned almost in, in the rest of my career. And just because it was all about dynamism, you know, and, and that led to me creating Barasti Bar because you're looking for that, that, that dynamism all the time. You're looking for something which was, which was going to make money, was going to be exciting, was fresh. And the, the restaurants have to be, have buzz, have to have work. The entertainment has to, has to work. And that's what Sun City taught me. And so my advice is for anyone, if you want to get into the industry, is try and get into some of the big corporations, the big properties, something where you're really going to understand dynamism. Later on in life, you can go to the small ones. Uh, one day when you own them, or you've got shares in them, or, or want to partner them or something, go to the small ones. In some people, it will suit you from day one. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm just saying is uh, I, my, I would try and go in and try and get into something exciting while you've got the energy, and you're young, and you're, and you're free, and you're single, and you can take risks, and you can go. You know, One day when you have families, and you, know, you, don't, you, you can't move around as much, then you can suddenly start settling down into, into other properties. Um, but anyway, as I said, so, so you know, general managers used to come and they used to say, you know, please, can you, can you write these things? And I just took that, that slight angle off the big corporations and tried to identify areas where they possibly aren't as good as they like to say they are. And the areas, and, and particularly on the fact that I'm now an owner. I'm not now an operator anymore. I'm an owner. So it's my job to highlight and bring out to the front areas of opportunity when it comes to owners and their relationship with, with um, the big brands. And I'm sure you'll see, those who did read it, will see in it a lot of that is coming through all the time. You know, what are we looking for from, from management? What are we looking for from owners? What is the responsibility of owners? Now remember, a lot of that is what you're going to, going to be doing for the big corporations. You're going to be doing some owner or owner's representative or managing director of some owner's company like myself is going to be looking at, 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 at you guys and saying, what are you doing for our company? What, what value are you bringing? What money are you bringing in? Then the guy next door, he's got his place pumping, it's full, and partying, there's drinking, there's eating, there's rooms are full, and your hotel is 75% full, half the restaurants aren't working, and you know, and so what are we going to say? We're going to say, look here, you know, you've got to shine up and, 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 and start bringing that business in. Yeah? So that's where this is about. So understand where it comes from. It comes from an owner's point of view as opposed to the, the brand's point of view or the, the big corporation's point of view. So hopefully you understood that and picked up on it. And it's not malicious in any way. And it's not negative in any way. It's just saying, as an owner, this is what we expect from you guys who are the managers or will be the managers, unless you're an owner, and you'll be doing the same thing. So I think that um, a lot of people have read the articles, and they've probably got some questions prepared for you. I think you've got a class, a lot of people have a class at 3 o'clock, so we should no, I've been talking too long. So. Try and, <laughs> uh, and you know how I said that uh, the first prize for the best question was going to be dinner for two at JBH? Well, Mike has trumped that, and so the first prize is now 
A Night for Two at Ibn Battuta. At the Ibn Battuta Gate Hotel, yeah. Ibn Battuta Gate Hotel. And the second prize is the JBH. <laughs> okay, so if you're happy, shall we... Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so can we have some questions for Mike, please? Stop talking about who you're going to take with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Questions, please, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Well. Um, Mr. Scully, you said in the article, who is in charge? That owners should be assured that management companies are using best practices to maintain and increase profitability. Um, and you also mentioned as a possible solution that broadening the market spectrum and also increasing the market, uh, the source markets. So, if a business in Dubai, um, the core business is operating the hotels, and their profits and their development is stagnating, would you advise an unrelated or related diversification? And if unrelated, how do you determine where to diversify into? Oh, it could be. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Everything's relative, you know. We've got we've got a situation in our one hotel in Deira, Movenpick Deira, right now, where they are struggling. Uh, who knows the Deira market at all? Does anyone go down to Deira market? No, you don't. Exactly. Neither do I. And so it's struggling. And neither does anyone else in Dubai. So Deira is struggling. And the GM there, he's been here a long, a long time. Michael Nugent, a good guy, knows the market and everything like that. And he's gone and he's just gone into outside catering, for example. And he's now almost doubled the food and beverage taking by going into outside catering. And so that's obviously a related diversification to something they weren't going, they didn't have any. In the pre-opening, we didn't put any budgets to, to, to outside catering trucks and everything. So we had to invest a bit, and, and, and it's working. It's working very well. Um, you know, the key is, is cash. You've got to make cash. You know, if, you, if you can diversify into, into some other area, which is, which is you know, outside the industry and it's safe, you're not going to spend a lot of money and going to things you don't know what you're doing. Um, but if it's going to make money and everyone agrees it's going to, you know, you've got to diversify, you diversify. And if you can keep it within the industry, obviously it helps, it complements, there's more chance of it working. I mean, we know that 80% of small businesses fail. Now, there's no reason why a small diversified part of the business is not going to fail either, you know, particularly if you don't know it. I think it's a, a case, you know, you may you may find that you've got someone really good in your, in your team who can cut hair. So you, know, you can put a little hairdressing thing in there and you know, they can cut hair, you know, make a little bit of money. What I'm saying is, is there's someone, maybe you've got someone really good in PR and you start a little PR market firm on the, on the side you know, from the hotel and you, you do other people's PR in other words, or you do other people's marketing. Or, you know, there are lots of ways, depending on how big or how small you are, that you can, you can diversify. And yeah, some people go into cosmetics and they run their own cosmetic lines, you know, marketing and through the hotel. So uh, I guess, does that answer your question? You know, it, it really it depends on the, on the property, where you are, what you are, the, the market, how big the city is, opportunities. You know, there's huge amounts of things, as would be in any business, that you would, you would, you would you'd do the same. Where, what I was really referring to, to there more than anything else would be obviously keeping it in house and, and or in industry as such. And let's say you haven't been for the Chinese market because you didn't need them. You go and, you go and hit the Chinese market. Well, you, you find that more people are coming in from South America. You know, Emirates Airlines have just gone to, to, to sort of flying into South America. So you go and you hit the South American market because you hadn't done that before. Now, again, it depends on, on the size of your properties. I mean, I always used to say at Mina Siyahi that we were not a source market, destination market, pioneering company. You know, we weren't big enough. We had 500 rooms, but Jumeirah is big enough. Jumeirah could do it. You know, they've got six hotels around town. So they were a great company to go and pioneer source markets. What we would then do is we would run it on the back of Jumeirah. So you know, Jumeirah would then go and get the Chinese market, and when you couldn't take any more rooms, then we would come in. Yeah, we were always available. We always made sure that we would be one of the first, first choice of, of, of referral or, or second, but we wouldn't have the money or the resources to go and pioneer markets. There you go. And um, you also said, talked about innovation, and you compared hotels, currently in Dubai market, to the malls, and that malls, what malls all do to attract people. For example, you, um, you said with the skydiving um, to attract people. So, where do you currently think that innovation primarily should take place in hotels? Is it technology or is it additional services? And 
what do you think, what type of innovation you personally, personally think would drive people into a specific hotel? <laughs> okay, to, to go through, I, I've got quite a negative to, to most hotels and hotels groups from the point of view is I think that hotels have lost the art of entertaining. They've lost the art of excitement. What happened in, in the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, 20 years, uh, yeah, with, the, with the, the likes of the big brands, they predominantly have been rooms orientated, rooms focused. Yeah, that's why there's so few good restaurants and top five star hotels around the world, yeah? or popular restaurants. Now, you're starting to get the phenomenon of your, of your, of your speciality chefs and famous chefs and putting in, because they're starting to realize the value of food and beverage in, in hotels. Not necessarily the bottom line, but the fact that people come in, you know, it keeps the name of the hotel, the secretaries come in, the secretaries are the ones who book the people. They, they say, yeah, we must, you know, next time they're booking someone, they say, well, let's, let's book at that hotel because it's fun. It's a great restaurant. The people are there. It's in. You know? So that's the value of, of, of that. And um, you know, so too many of, of the groups have, have lost the art of doing it. And, and what, another phenomenon you found within in the, the, the hospitality industry, and particularly the big groups, is the big groups felt and, and it's in there as well, that the, that the group and the brand is bigger than the individual. Now, on a worldwide basis, they're absolutely right. But for you running my hotel, the brand is not be all and end all. Okay? The, the manager, the management, the staff, the, the, the restaurants, the bars, they are bigger for me than the, than, the, than the brand. Now, you can have a hotel in London where there's no restaurant, there's a bed factory. They're the brand rules because they pump. They've got huge loyalty. They've got big loyalty schemes, and they pump that hotel. In Dubai, if I've got a semi-resort property, I'm probably getting very little in from the brand. Most of my business is, is, is locally negotiated. The F&B is all created on, on ground by the management, by the team, by the staff. So for me as an owner, and as far as I'm concerned, 95% of my guests the manager and the staff are far bigger than the brand. Now, if you go and speak to the brand guys, they'll say, never. You know, we are X brand, and we are far bigger than anyone. And they, they like to do it, but they, they don't. And they don't put enough resources into making sure that that individual property is running properly. What they do is they look at the big picture, and they say, how many rooms are we putting in through the system? And that's what they're interested in, because that's their shareholder value. And remember that you're dealing in a, in, a, in, a, in a shareholder value environment now. Now, if I was running any of the big groups, I would have the same mentality because I've got a commitment to my shareholders. My commitment isn't to each individual property. Now, don't get me wrong, they, they do look after each individual property, but they don't necessarily have the same. I mean, you only have to take an example now of Bahrain. What is happening in uh, not Bahrain, Abu Dhabi? What's happening in Abu Dhabi? Abu Dhabi went and tried to copy Dubai. So what they've done is they've gone and put on all these beach hotels, which look like city center hotels, give city center um, service, give everything city center. They haven't built one really good family-orientated resort property. So they didn't go and they didn't, they didn't look at Dubai and say, well, what's Dubai good at? Now let's try and create a good bit of difference. And did, did any of the big brands go to them and, and promote that? No, they didn't. They just took what was being offered and took and, and promoted a design which makes their brand look good, conforms to their brand, makes sure that they have a nice-looking five-star full of marble hotel. Whereas what these guys should have done, if I was running Abu Dhabi, I would, be having, I would have the most fun. Sadiat Island and, 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 and what's the other island or whatever? I would, yes, Island, I would just have those places pumping with fun resort hotels, family, um, slides everywhere, mini parks everywhere, and just get some life. Because that's what, that's what Dubai needs. That's a gap. Dubai doesn't have it, but Dubai doesn't need it. Dubai's developed really nicely in the way they have. But don't just go and copy Dubai, because you're not going to beat it. And they're all sitting there. They're sitting half full. You know? They're struggling. And they're going to struggle for a long time until they change their concepts and, and identify what they need. But Dubai needs that. Does Abu Dhabi need the same thing? The? I'm saying Dubai needs that. Does Abu Dhabi need the same thing? Well, that's what I'm saying. And Dubai should be going that way in the future as well, because funny enough, that if you take the, the third palm, that was going to be exactly that. The third palm was going to be a four, three, four-star resort fun destination. And then the crash happened. So that was actually the next move for Dubai. 
And this is where Abu Dhabi should have gone uh, the same way. And uh, they may, hopefully they will do. But they, they, someone didn't identify it in that, in that thing. Or they didn't identify a different market, whether it's an old age market. They did identify one market, the cultural market. Okay, but the cultural market needs the Louvre Museum and, uh, and you know, a couple of these things which didn't come along again because of, because of the crash. But again, the cultural market is, you know, Paris is a cultural market, London's a cultural market, Rome's a cultural market. Abu Dhabi is not going to just get a cultural market. You need a lot more activities than that to do. So that's where I would be going. If I was Abu Dhabi, that's where I would be heading. I look for that difference and start developing in that, in that line. Last question, please. Oh. Um, Manuel, Manuel, just let somebody else have on, because we've got to finish in 20 minutes. Uh, Mr. Scully, you had been running hotels all over the world and managing hotels. Why did you decide to become an entrepreneur? I've always, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've, I've, I've always had that. I mean, I don't know. If, do any of you drink Coffee Planet? Do any of you know Coffee Planet? Yeah. Best coffee in the world, isn't it? Dubai? <laughs> that's, that's my business as well. I started that with, um, when I was in the for about 10 years ago. You know, we do all the petrol stations. Um, we've got a big roastery now in, in Jebel Ali. Um, you, I, I think it's, you, you, you're either entrepreneurial or you're not. And you, I mean, entrepreneurial, you have to be entrepreneurial in your job for an owner or for someone else. I mean, the best managers are the most entrepreneurial. So whether you're entrepreneurial for yourself or for whoever you're working for, it doesn't matter. You've got to have that same entrepreneurial mentality when you're, running, when you're running someone else's business. It's actually even more important for them because you know, you're, you're dealing with someone else's money. You know? Sorry, I'll, I'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, earlier you said um, that you would recommend us for now when we're still young and energetic to go somewhere where we can get a lot of experience with like, energetic um, environments and work in big hotels where there's a lot going on. So at the moment, where would you, if you were um, Young, like, as where would you go? Like, <laughs> I'm saying I am. Huh? <laughs> you don't know how young I am. <laughs> okay, so where would I, where would I go now? Yeah, where would you stay here in the Middle East? Would you go to Macau or the, I don't know. Well, Sid, I tell you, I mean, Dubai, you are at the center of, of, of innovation and fun in Dubai. I mean, you can't, you can't have a better, more innovative place to be than, than Dubai. So there, there's a start. Um, I mean, Europe. Europe is dead. I guess. I guess there's some places in the east, uh, like Macau. Singapore is, is is hot. You know, that's that's also vibrant. Restaurants, big chefs, big names, all the big groups there. That's that's going well. And um, Australia's never really suffered from it, but um, you know, they, that's apparently. I think there's some quite good places. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I was just fortunate. Yeah, I, I, luckily, Sun City. When I just got into Sun City, it was just the most vibrant place, one of the, one of the most vibrant places in the world. And then I, then I did London, which I think everyone has to do London. And then I sent down here 20 years ago, and, and I've just never left. You know what I mean? It's just been. So yeah, the, you, yeah, you've got to look at the find somewhere where it's just dynamic, and there's a lot of development and, and a lot of growth. Sorry. Uh, this is sort of more of a philosophical, or humanistic question. Um, you're saying that people have moved away from, from creativity in, in, in hotels and sort of gone into this factory, sort of pumping out rooms and, and ignoring F and B and things like that. Um, why has that happened over time? Um, and for the people that are focusing on being entrepreneurial, um, such as Soul Curse and or, or, or um, Richard Branson, um, are these traits are, are these uh, traits in these people are they born with them or is it something they've acquired over time? And uh, as a leader, are you, do you have any suggestions for um, building those or cultivating those, those kinds of traits in subordinates? No, I think, I think some people are born with, and, and, be, and some people are more entrepreneurial than others. And, and other people are inspired. You know, if you, if you work, like I said, I worked for a very inspirational company. At the time, Sun City was just exploding and just, it just embedded in your brain. You know, every time you did something, you had to do something but better and make more money and it was just, you know, it became a culture. Now, whether I had that culture before, or developed it there, or maybe I could have developed a lot better somewhere else, who knows? But I think it's just something you've got to be so aware of your market and understand, and you've got to have the energy and the spirit. You know, I think if people with energy and spirit, they can, you pick it up quickly. You understand those who really want to make things work. And if you can, you can. You know, some people are quite laid back and they, you know, they say, you know, nine to five job and just do whatever. And you know, the hotel industry isn't all about working long hours. It's just about working when you need it, putting energy into the right areas and having fun. If you don't enjoy it, 
you won't have fun and you won't do it. You know what I mean? So you've got to be in, whatever you do, you've got to be in an industry which you like. And that's why I was saying in the beginning, some of you will stay and some of you will go. Some of you will be inspired by the industry and, and, and will become entrepreneurs when it's in it. And others are going to say, yeah, I'd you know, like to do something else. Sorry, you were first and then, then you. <laughs> um, yes? Yeah? No. Is that, is that mine? <laughs> oh, hell, I'm not going to tell you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't see that. And I, no. I, don't, I don't think I've got any pictures like that. Maybe it was on the next page or something. Or the next article. Oh, was it? Okay. Oh, it's, it's wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Which department would you give the, you know, in a big hotel, which department would you, would you give this uh, responsibility to? And how much business would you expect to come from social media? Things? You know, yeah, social media, we're going to talk social media, social media, social media. What is social media? Marketing online and, uh, yeah. What, what, is, what is social media? <laughs> social media, all, all social media, okay, is what the internet was a couple of years ago, what the telephone was a couple of years ago, what the newspaper was a couple of years ago, what it's just another medium today for getting your message out. That's all it is. It's just, you know, before I would send lots of emails and I'd have a, a lot of email database. And then before that I would have, uh, you know, I'd be faxing 500 faxes to the machine to get the message out. Yeah? All you're doing, and, and, and people put a lot of hype around social media. Social media is just the new way of getting to whichever market. So you've got to know your clients. You've got to know who's cool. The danger with it is that people follow cool. Huh? It's cool to, be, to go to this place. So I remember, when I, again, when we started the Barasti and, and Minasiak in those days, I had about four air hostesses. The, any party I did, any event I, I did, I'd phone them. I'd just phone four girls. And they had, I don't know how they had it, but they had like 150 names on their, their phone or whatever it is. And they just got the message out. Party at Minas you know? One drink for you, <laughs> whatever it was. Eh? And I'm telling you, those four girls packed out my place. <laughs> that's it. Okay? Now that's social media. That's social marketing. It's just not done through what you're talking about. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm not belittling social media. Don't get me wrong. Eh? I mean, social media is the way to do it now. But it's just communication. And what you've got to do is find the best form of communication. Find out the guy, the social media, who's got, I mean, Twitter now. How does Twitter work? Twitter works by who's cool, who's got the most names, doesn't it? Is that right? Yeah. That's all it is. I mean, so it's, it's the same. You've got to understand, and that's knowing your business, eh? that's understanding what is cool? Being with the cool people. Understand. No, not everything is cool. I mean, cool is to run your nightclub or your bars. Maybe for, for your rooms, it's not the cool. It's, it's the secretary's club or, or whatever. You know what I mean? So you adapt it to the market you're going for at the time you're going for it. And what, what outlets you got. But it's, it's knowing your market, knowing the people, being savvy, being in, you know? And I tell you, you, you go around town. And I mean, I go out a lot in this town. And I don't see any other managers out. Hardly ever. So I wonder, how do they know what's going on? How do they know what's cool and what's right and what's, what's the in crowd? You know? If you go to Zuma, Zuma is pumping. Zuma works. You know? If you go to um, you know, Nassimi, that pumps. You, know? you can see the people who know the market and, and they get it. I mean, half those guys are, used to work for me. Why? Because they understand the market. They know how to get them working. And you, you've just got to adapt to What's the latest means of getting your message out? So that's what social media is. You know what I mean? So there's nothing new. And that's what I'm trying to say. It's not new. The means is new. The method's new. But all it is is being savvy. And just remember that Twitter and Facebook won't be there in three years' time. Something else was taken over or a new derivative or, you know what I mean? It's, it, it, things evolve. You know, it's like a, sorry. Yeah. What is the? What is it exactly that has kept you in this industry for such a long 
Oh, Christ, I don't think no one else would take me. I, 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 I don't know. I just I think just because I love it. You know what I mean? I think I, I, I do it. I, it. It inspires me. I've been very fortunate to work in areas and in hotels that I've really enjoyed working. So, you know, I opened the Crown Plaza, and then I joined the government to develop Minasiaki. I actually set up the contract for Crown Plaza to take Minasiaki. And some guy decided to do the wrong thing, and I went and joined the government. And it lost Crown Plaza hundreds of millions in, in fees over 25 years because they didn't play the right game. So you know, never take anyone for granted. Never take any of your employees or people who, who are entrepreneurial or who do develop things for you, don't ever take them for granted eh? because they can turn the tables on you. And they can lose you a lot of money or they can make you a lot of money. And I've always been fortunate. And then I joined uh, Minasiaki, and, and Minasiaki was always a development. You know, we built the marina, then we built Barusti, then we built the Meridian, then we built the Western. So there's always something on the go. And then I went to, to, to the Sheikh and to Saeed Harabu I was working for, and I said, listen, I want to start a coffee business. Do you mind? I said, it won't, in, you know, won't infringe on my, my work at all. And they said, fine. So I started Coffee Planet. And I had a partner who managed the day-to-day, the day -day, and I just did the sort of strategy side. So, but I was completely open and honest, and yeah, I told him, and they said, yes, you can. And I actually even got my boss's son to sponsor the company. You know what I mean? So it was, it was totally open, and then, so yeah, so that's why. Sorry, oh, you're at the back, you're right at the back here. You, shame, your arm's been up for an hour. changing your work, your job? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be too difficult. No, you know what I mean? I, I, like I did, I started my own business. But obviously in the same industry. This is my, this, I know this industry, and I know that this is a chance. This is, I, I've got more chance of succeeding in this industry than anything else. So, but I couldn't think, you know, unless I won the pools or something one day. Sorry, in front of you. Sir, from the article where I've had any meetings, you mentioned the usage of multi-banded facilities. Do you think of hotels use them a lot for hotel brand itself, or do you forgot them? Um, multi? Multi-branded facilities. Yeah, you know, that, that's an idea uh, that, that's, that's used in Vegas quite a lot. And, it's, and, you, and you, what you find is that a developer develops one building, and you've got four different entrances. And you, know, you go in one, and there's a Novotel, and another one is an Intercon, and another one is a Four Seasons or whatever. And I think just, you know, over, over time, you, you might find a lot more of, of that is, is happening. You know? um, it depends on where in the world, you know. It's, it's, I think you've got a purpose built them, build them for that. And it's a little bit like on the, on the innovation line, you know. What razzmatazz are you going to have in there? What are you going to bring people? You know, you know, here you've got, you know, instead of 200 rooms for one brand sitting at 60% full, you can have two brands or three brands sitting at 100% full. Now, as an owner, I'd be much happier, wouldn't I? So that's, that's the idea of that, and that could happen. Sorry, where, was, where were we? No, oh, no you want... So you have... Hi. The? Business hotels. Which hotel? Business hotels. Business hotels. Oh, business hotels. Oh, business hotels. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you think the way that Dubai is marketing itself, that market would disappear in the future? No. No, no. Dubai, Dubai is the center of the earth. Okay. I, no, I mean in the best way. Dubai is, is you know, it's east, west, south, north. We're, we're the center of the Arab world here. You know, it's, it's as long as everything stays as it is, I mean, this will, this will pray, you know. But uh, Iran, I'm sure, will come right in the next five years or ten years. Dubai will be the center. Um, you know, Iraq is, is, is going. Dubai is the center. It's the trade center, and, and Emirates Lions, uh, Airlines are doing such an unbelievable job for us. I mean, they've got another hundred wide-body planes coming. You know, so I don't, I, I'm so confident about Dubai. I think... The, Dubai will be the demise of, of places like Qatar and Bahrain. Well, Qatar's got the World Cup coming. But they're going to struggle because they didn't build the infrastructure. I mean, one, one of the big local guys who, who I'm working for now, Sultan bin Salem, and Sultan was, was responsible for, for the World Islands and the Khil, the projects and everything. Let me tell you, although they didn't, in the end, because of the world, the prop, big property crash, they crashed, he was, he was a very, very imaginative guy. Eh? And he created all this. And he said one thing to me when I joined, joined his company. He said, one thing that Dubai did, and which no one else has done, is we spent the money. And whatever you say about the, the, the crisis and the, and the crash, whatever it is, there's one thing that Dubai did, and that's it spent the money. No one else can spend it. Bahrain can't spend the money. Forget the problems they're having now. You know what I mean? Abu Dhabi is struggling now. Although they've got all the oil, they haven't built the infrastructure which, which Dubai has. None of the Emirates will. And so 
That is the key to Dubai. We've got this. We've got huge amounts of, of office space sitting there cheap. So it's, it's economically viable to, do, to set up business in Dubai now. And the markets are here. Do you think that in the hospitality industry, it is easy to like, cancel family life and success in work? Or not? Yeah. yeah. For me, it was very easy. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's more difficult for a woman, obviously, if you've got family and you've got kids. Far more difficult. For a guy, much easier. You know? you, your family, you've got, you know, you've, got, you've got help at home and you've got things which makes it, uh, makes it easier. Vibrant society. So, and it depends on the, on the industry. And I know. So I think so, the, the reason so few of, are still in the industry from, from when I was there is that there were a lot of girls in the class as well. I think you know, it's, it's a fact. People get married and have families, and it makes it more difficult. So it's not, a, it doesn't, it's not easy, huh? but it depends on you. It depends on your situation. It depends on what you can do. It depends on the type of hotels you can go, how much you can move, where you can move. You know, you know, the family situation makes a huge, a huge difference to what you are able to do. But you know, you're still able to do a huge amount in a city, in one place. I, mean, I stayed here 20 years. You know what I mean? So anyone can stay 20 years. Answer? A little bit, huh? <laughs> uh, you were involved in working with a lot of hotels. And what do you find was the most challenging thing like, for you? And what can you like, uh, advise for us, maybe for one who's going to open a hotel, to focus on more? I think, I think, I think your, your most challenging is, is generally getting staff. Huh? That's your, yeah, you've got to create the right concepts. So the most imaginative thing you've got to do when you're opening properties, is the first thing you've got to do, and I've opened probably 40, 50 different restaurants and bars in the, in the city between all of that. You've got to get the right concepts. And some work and some don't. I've had brilliant ones. Who's been to Bussola? You know Bussola, an Italian restaurant, also, also a Minasiaki? Oh, yeah. Brilliantly successful. You know, when I opened Crown Plaza, um, out of the seven restaurants, they all worked brilliantly, except for the Japanese. I couldn't get the Japanese working. So the steakhouse was fantastic, the pub was fantastic, the, well, the main restaurant's the main restaurant. We did a, a Lebanese, pumped. I couldn't, I couldn't get the Japanese working. And it was just one of those things. You, know, you can make some work and you can't, and you'll lose some. But you know, you've got to, it's, a, it's a thing of averages. Sorry. Um, you said also in the article that it is today essential to have enough cash at hand at a, for a hospitality company. So Jumeirah being now a little bit the cash cow to we're holding, um, getting a little bit squeezed out, what would you change if you would be in charge of Jumeirah? Like, where do you see that Jumeirah is going when it's further playing this role of paying the we're holding stats? Okay, I don't know. Um, you know, so, so much depends on the properties you're given. So Jumeirah being given, Jumeirah, okay, I know you're, you're both government and, and Dubai Holdings are government, but if there's no development in hotels that you've got, there's not much more you can do. You know? I mean, you, Jumeirah does fantastically already. I mean, your, your rates are sky high. Your occupancy levels are sky high. You've been given, remember, you, 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 a bit of an easy job, eh? Um, I, don't mean in the, in the, I mean in a nice way, because the, the, the owning company have given you a fantastic product. I mean, if you're a resort product and you have a, 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 have a wild wadi, it's instant success. Why do you think Atlantis is so successful? Because they've got, they've got um, Aqua Aqua Venture. Aqua Venture. Yeah. Tourists want it. Tourists want it. And a little bit about what I was saying where, where Abu Dhabi have gone wrong. Yeah. They, they look at the success of, of, of um, Atlantis and, and Jumeirah with the water parks and with the facilities and everything like that. That's what you need. That's what people want. They want activities. Why do you think the cruise, cruise liners are going so well? Why is that so, so, so popular? Now? Why? Because it's one destination, everything on there. You, know, you don't have to worry about your kids. You know, there's disco, there's parties, there's slides, there's eating, there's drinking, there's smoking. There's whatever they have to do, they can do it. You know what I mean? And that's, that's what it's like. That's what people want. Yeah. So it's all about fun and activity, you know. And if you're going to do family, then, then give fun, yeah. and that's and that's and that's your lesson. So I think Jumeirah are doing a fantastic job, and I'm not just saying it. Eh? I think Jumeirah are doing an unbelievable job. Whether they could ha have a couple more Nasimis or something, maybe. But then you know maybe they don't want to disturb their guests. You know maybe they don't need to, whereas maybe Atlantis wanted it. So different folks, different strikes. You know. So who have I ignored? Sorry, just a quick question. A few of us were having a good discussion this morning about hospitality in the future, especially for hotel rooms. So we were discussing the, the idea of rooms becoming much more technology, you know, the use of technology mm -hmm. in rooms. But 
I, on the other hand, stood away and said, but you'd lose the personal contact and touch to hospitality, which is what makes it so great at the moment. Do you think that would ever be the case, that you as a guest walk into a room and to get into your room, you have no contact with anyone? It's all very much through your phone and... No. Because... I don't know. I go into a room. There's no one else there, so I don't know. I don't. I don't, I don't know what. You, so I don't know what you're referring to. Okay. okay. So, well, you know, so, so you got I mean, room service has to be delivered. You know what I mean? And it's, no, I'm being facetious. I'm, I'm joking. But I know. I know where you're getting from. No, I think. I don't think so. I think. I think the hotels as a whole, where they became these bed factories, I think they lost all personality. And I think these three-star places where you go and vend out of a, a machine when you arrive, it's just no personality. But then, you know, if, the, if you're paying 100 dirhams as opposed to 500 dirhams or 5,000 dirhams a night, you know, and, you, and, and that's what your company does, then, then that's what it is. But I think, I think what you're finding, though, that, that there's more emphasis going back to restaurants and putting bars in restaurants. And people are starting to realize the value of having good restaurants and bars and, and hotels. And that's why you're seeing so many international chefs and that you know, being employed to do so I think actually there's a swing, to be honest, going back. Yeah. Technology is technology. I mean, you know, I stayed at the Burj Al Arab one night because I wanted to stay there. And um, again, you know, well, it was my family. But let me tell you, we couldn't work anything. You know that? We couldn't. Now, there's technology gone wrong. I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't shut the curtains. We couldn't close those desks. We couldn't turn the light, half the lights off. And, but I think they had, they had problems. It was right near the beginning. I, mean, yeah. I think they got it sorted out. But, but that's where technology can be difficult or go, go wrong, you know. No, it's just because you talk about the emphasis on staffing and like building it very much from the people that they deliver the service. Yes, but of it's just interesting oh. that that's your take on how yeah. it should be done. Whereas a few of us this morning had a discussion about how technology could be the. Yeah, I mean, look, at technology can make makes your life easier, but that's that's all really. And I think technology allows you to have less staff, but you still need it. And um, when you decided to become an entrepreneur and have your own business, you decided on actually coffee, which, I mean, looking around Dubai, there's so many coffee places already. Why did you choose to have a coffee place? Why okay, good question. Okay. What, what do you think is different about my coffee business to every other coffee business? You roast your own coffee. Eh? It's, it's a real coffee from the machine, basically. Yeah, we're the only ones who do it. Uh, we found a gap uh, in it, and, and my partner, actually, I, I, had, I had another business, uh, Flags, and we did all the signage for Madinat, and to me, I, I had a signage business. And uh, everything was being copied here, and it was getting difficult to do business in the signage business. So I was looking for something else, and I took a partner on, and he said to me, I've seen this coffee system in England, working on the, big, on the highways, you know, the, in, the, in the big petrol stations on the highways, and I think it's a really good idea. And I was just about to go on a business trip over, and so I said, oh, let me go and have a look. I looked at it, and it, I saw this, this idea, and I thought, that's brilliant. It will work, work, it will work well here. So I got on that week. I went, got a plane to America, got the rights for the machine for the Middle East, and started the business. So that's why we're in all the ad knocks. We've got about 180 sites. We do all the IKEAs, um, to quite a few hotels. So 100% and, and Arabica. We were the first to bring 100% Arabica into the market. And then fresh bean, fresh milk out of the machines. So again, this is the only reason I'm telling you is that it, it was an idea. Finding a gap and knowing that it will work, then I went and found the finance and, and, and et cetera. So it's, it's different. And you're right. I mean, there's so many coffee shops. And how do you compete with Starbucks and Costa in that field? And they can't compete because I own the rights now for that machine for the Middle East. And there's no other machine that works like that. So. Yeah. We've got, we are opening another two hotels with, with the Royal Amwaj, which you saw there, and then we've got Oceana. Anyone been to West 14 yeah. on the Palm? Yeah. West 14? You been there? Okay, the steakhouse at, at, on Oceana, that whole complex is ours, and we've got a hotel coming in there. So we've got that, and we just, we've just launched a management company here called, I don't know if you've heard of Bridge Street Worldwide, they're one of the largest apartment hotel companies. So we are now um, are the managing partner for... Um, uh, Bridge Street Worldwide in, in um, for the Middle East, and we're busy bidding now on four hotels to to manage. So we're actually getting back into management as opposed to ownership. 
we're getting back into management as well, but apartment hotels. Now, there, you know, apartment hotels, no restaurants, anything. it's apartment hotel. You might have a little coffee shop downstairs, but the concept is apartments, yeah. service departments. Now, short, medium, long term. If you hit the the I'm time, sure and the Grand Prix is coming up as well, so I know you're all sitting there. Thank <laughs> God. I'd like to thank you so much for your time. It was so informative and, uh, and really, really interesting and fun. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.